Lecture 47, The Mechanics of Folding Class 1b, or parallel folds, may be explained by three kinematic models. Orthogonal flexure, flexural shear, and volume loss flexure. Collectively, these models are called flexural folding. In all three models, the thickness of the layers remain constant. Dynamically speaking, flexural folding can result from either bending or buckling. In bending, pairs of forces that produce equal and opposite torques generate the fold. A monocline above a normal fault in basement is a good example. In buckling, compressive stresses parallel to a competent layer generate a buckling instability in folding. In orthogonal flexure, lines perpendicular to the layer remain so after folding. There is lengthening of the convex side of the fold and shortening of the concave side of the fold. This kinematic model is characteristic of folds with low curvature in competent layers. Flexural shear involves simple shear parallel to the layers. No lengthening or shortening of the convex and concave sides of the fold occurs. This is analogous to the bending of a deck of cards. Material on the convex side of a shear plane moves toward the fold hinge, and vice versa. The magnitude of shear decreases towards the hinge and is zero at the hinge. Volume loss flexure involves the formation of class 1b folds by the gradual removal of rock material from particular zones in a folded layer. Notice that this process can also form other types of folds, such as class 1c and 2 folds. The lower figure in section A shows negative photos of a fold, emphasizing layering and foliation. Section B shows the fold restored by opening it along major solution seams. The volume of material lost is indicated by the blank areas. This figure shows the strain distribution of class 1B folds formed by bending. The blue lines and points on the stereo net correspond to the hinge of the anticline, the red lines and points are the inflection line, and the green lines and points are the hinge of the syncline. Figure A is the undeformed layer. There is no strain in the profile view of the fold, and the angle alineation makes with the fold axis is beta. Figure B shows bending by orthogonal flexure. In this case, the outer arc of the anticline is stretched, and the inner arc is shortened. The opposite occurs in the syncline. There is a neutral surface separating the zones of shortening and extension. On this surface, there is no strain, and the angle of the lineation with the fold axis is beta. In the top surface, however, there is extension perpendicular to the fold axis in the anticline, and shortening in the syncline. Also the angle the lineation makes with the fold axis varies, from beta A, at the anticlinal hinge, to beta L, at the inflection line, to beta S, at the synclinal hinge. Figure C shows bending by flexural shear. The strain ellipses on the profile view indicate maximum shear at the inflection line. The shear is towards the anticlinal hinge and away from the synclinal hinge. The shear is zero at the anticlinal hinge and synclinal hinge. The surface of the layer has not strain. This is because the layer has not been extended or shortened. The angle the lineation makes with the fold axis is beta. Bending by volume loss flexure results from solution along seams, concentrated on the concave side of the fold. Thus the layer is shortened in a direction normal to the hinge on the concave side of the fold, whereas the convex side undergoes no strain and forms a neutral surface. On a layer surface, the anticlinal limb shows no strain, while the concave synclinal limb shows shortening perpendicular to the fold axis. The angle the lineation makes with the fold axis is beta at the anticlinal hinge and at the inflection line. This angle however is reduced to beta s at the synclinal hinge. This figure shows the strain distribution of class 1b folds formed by buckling. The blue lines and points on the stereo net correspond to the hinge of the anticline, the red lines and points are the inflection line, and the green lines and points are the hinge of the syncline. In bucking, the layer is homogeneously shortened by layer parallel compression, before folding. 
The angle that the lineation makes with the fold axis is beta prime. Therefore, this initial strain before folding is superimposed to the strain produced by folding due to either orthogonal flexure, flexural shear, or volume loss flexure. This means that zones that during folding experience shortening perpendicular to the fold hinge will look more shortened at the end. And zones that experience extension perpendicular to the fold hinge will look less extended at the end. Notice that for flexural shear in C, the layer surface shows homogeneous strain, but this strain is not related to the folding, but to the layered parallel compression before folding. Now, let's talk about a mechanism that produces class 2 folds. Passive shear folding, also called passive flow folding, occurs in an incompetent layer which acts simply as a marker that records the deformation and thus exerts no influence on the process of folding. The deformation takes place by inhomogeneous simple shear on shear planes that crosscut the layer. This type of deformation is characteristic of high-grade metamorphic rocks, salt domes, and glaciers. This figure shows the strain on the profile view and surface of a fold formed by passive shear folding. In this case, the slip vectors are parallel to the axial surface of the fold. An original lineation, L0, is folded to a lineation, L. This folded lineation is contained in the plane A, P, C on figure C. Figure D shows the fold axis, F1, the axial surface, S1, the slip vector, A, the original lineation, L0, and the plane containing the folded lineation. The great circles are bedding planes on the fold. Notice that the slip direction, A, is defined by the intersection of the axial surface and a vertical plane containing the lineation. After forming, folds can be modified by pure shear. Figure A shows a class 1B fold formed by orthogonal flexure. Figure B shows the fold after 20% shortening, and figure C after 50% shortening. Notice that it does not take much homogeneous shortening to erase the earlier phase of deformation. So far we have discussed a rock layer of homogeneous properties. However, rock sequences are formed of multilayers. Some layers will flow slowly under a given stress, and they will be competent, while other layers will deform rapidly under the same stress, and they will be incompetent. Here, we need to look at two things, the mean competence, and the competence contrast of the rock sequence. If the mean competence and competence contrast are low, passive shear folding will occur. If the mean competence is low, but the competence contrast is high, such that thin competent layers are within a thick incompetent interval, tigmatic folding will occur. Flexural shear folding will occur for mean competence and medium to low competence contrast. If the mean competence is high, and the competence contrast is high to low, flexural slip folding will predominate. In this case, we have thick competent layers, separated by thin incompetent layers. There is shear concentrated along the thin incompetent layers, between the competent layers. Figure B to the right, shows bedding planes and the lineations orientations in a fold produced by flexural slip folding. Flexural folding in multilayers requires competent layers in a planar mechanical anisotropy that is provided, for example, by low friction interfaces or thin incompetent interlayers. This is shown in figure A. Passive shear folding in multilayers requires that an incompetent material dominates the mechanical behavior and that the effect of any competent layers is negligible. This is shown in figure B. In any case, the long axis of the strain ellipse, or S1, will vary in orientation in the layers of different competents. This is an example of chevron folds formed by the flexural slip mechanism. They result in a space problem in the hinge zone, which is compensated by ductile flow of the incompetent layers, or collapse of the competent layers. The outcrop picture is an example of ductile flow of incompetent material in a hinge zone. Here is the interpretation of the outcrop. The left figure shows different structures forming in the competent layers, namely extension fractures or veins in the outer, stretched arcs, and ductile flow of the incompetent unit in the hinge zone. 
The right figure shows compatibility problems in the hinge area, which are solved by hinge collapse and reverse faulting. To learn more about this topic, read Chapter 12 of Fossen and do his e-learning module on folding. And answer these questions.